The setup on May 18, 2013 featured a negatively tilted upper level trough over the western U.S. that put southwesterly flow over the plains. This led to the formation of a surface low over southwest Kansas with a dry line draping from the low down through the panhandles. Rich moisture being advected into the area on southeast surface winds brought dew points in the mid to upper 60s through the southern and central plains and up to 70 degrees into Kansas. All the moisture and heating coupled with steep lapse rates led to mixed layer cape values in the extreme range from 3 to 4,000 joules per kilogram. With these conditions in place, agitated cumulus began to develop along the dry line and north of the surface low. And by mid-afternoon, storms were firing in eastern Colorado and in northwest Kansas. A short wave ejecting over the panhandles and Kansas by mid to late afternoon, along with strong heating along the dry line, helped convection to overcome the strong cap and develop further south along the dry line. By 7 to 8 p.m., deep layer shear had reached 40 to 50 knots along a corridor from northeast Colorado to west central Kansas. Low level storm relative helicity also ramped up with the strengthening low level jet reaching 200 meters squared per second squared. The combination of adequate deep layer shear and storm relative helicity combined with extreme instability led to supercells capable of producing tornadoes. My initial target starting the morning in Nebraska was to go down to the vicinity of Ashland in far south Kansas. After noting where development was occurring along the dry line, I moved up to southwest of Greensburg and waited for convection along this section of the dry line to take off. I followed a cell that started to strengthen southeast of Spearville, and it eventually produced two tornadoes near Rosal and Sanford. After car camping for the night south of McCook, Nebraska, I made my way south through Kansas toward my initial target near the Oklahoma border. I took advantage of some photo opportunities along the way. Skies were clearing and really priming the atmosphere for storms later in the afternoon. As I cruised along the dry line from Ashland towards Greensburg, towers started going up and then dying. They were leaving behind a bunch of sad orphan animals that were drifting away in disappointment. Finally, a cell managed to outwit the cap near Spearville. It started to get rooted into the boundary layer. And now we finally have a nice looking supercell with structure that really started to beef up. Up in the vault, I noticed this persistent little shear funnel that lasted for several minutes. RFD was making various attempts at nudging into the base when another cell popped up and started encroaching in from the south. I wasn't sure if it was going to wreck the leading cell or which base to focus on, so I split the difference and ended up getting a bit behind the lead cell that I was originally pacing. And that lead cell ended up eating the trailing cell and then it really took off. 
Now you can see the RFD is making a major push, digging a deep pocket into the Rain 3 base. Rotation was ramping up behind the clear slot and it was looking pretty imminent. Although it looks like the tornado is dissipating, the mesocyclone is still rotating and it was reported to have ongoing circulation on the ground. After four or five minutes, it started building another condensation funnel.
forgot how terrible the vibration is when I rest my camera on the dashboard. So I fuzzed out a lot of this amazing rope out sequence. So just a little bit further east, and there was a new mesocyclone and a tornado lurking in the shadows near Sanford. In this time lapse, you can watch the tornado make a cycloid pattern as it rotates counterclockwise around the broader mesocyclone circulation. Just like the first tornado, it looks like it's done, but circulation is still reportedly on the ground and drifting westward. Then we get this interesting little apparition. 